thought about it. Well, good evening. I now call this meeting to order. This is a regular meeting for the York County School Board, and this is our first time back at York Call, York Call after several months, and we're thankful for the opportunity to meet in person and continue to take steps forward and recognizing social distancing. So we are six feet apart when we're allowed to take our mask off to speak uh, while we're six feet apart, but we're encouraging our members uh, when they're not speaking to keep their mask on if they are, are able to. Um, we have heard many positive comments regarding classroom connections and applaud our teachers, our families, and our students for their continued patience and perseverance as we navigate through this process. I'd like to also mention that when we were meeting virtual, we were able to stream live on YouTube and Facebook. But when we're back here at your call, because we're in person, uh, we don't have that capability currently. And we're looking at the possibility of adding that, if we can. Uh, we're, we're just looking at it for right now, um, because we've had some, some people that have asked that don't have Cox Cable and don't have Verizon, but if you have those two services, you're able to watch it uh, directly and live. Uh, it just means you have to wait a day to watch it if you don't have that, um, which you'll be able to watch it on the YouTube channel by going through the link on our website at York County School Division. So I'd now like to read the York County School Division mission statement, and the mission of the York County School Division is to engage all students in acquiring the skills and knowledge needed to make productive contributions to the world. So next, I'd like to share some information regarding our pledge leader this evening, Kaylee Haggerty, a fifth grade student at Seaford Elementary School. Kaylee Haggerty, a fifth grade student at Seaford Elementary School, is a model student, and she comes to school every day with a smile on her face, an eagerness to learn, and a strong desire to help others. Whether it is in a classroom or on the soccer field, Kaylee takes pride in working hard to do her best. In addition to being an honor roll student, Every marking period, Kaylee has served as SCA representative, participated in K Kids and Garden Club, and she loves school and plans to be a kindergarten teacher when she grows up. She proudly comes from a family of educators, and although positively influenced by all, she also attributes her, her grandmother's passion for teaching as being her biggest inspiration. Kaylee's advice to her peers is to be kind to everyone and always have the courage to stand up against bullying. Kylie, exemplifi Kylie exemplifies what it means to be a positive difference maker in her school and in her community. So if we'd all stand for the Pledge of Allegiance, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Sorry about that. We had, some, we had some sound issues, and I thought the sound was going out, um, and we just weren't able to hear all of it, but it turns out nobody could hear all of it, <laughs> evidently. Uh, but we got it, got it done. But thank you very much, Kaylee, uh, for leading us in the pledge tonight. So now we're going to move to our recognitions and awards and our seniors of the month, and all the board members, that, all of us here, were able to participate today mm -hmm. and uh, visit most of our seniors' homes and present them with a, a nice yard sign and a... a a certificate and a cookie text um, tweet um, from cookie cookie text um, we were able to meet some of their parents and take a few photographs while social distancing and um, it was really exciting to see uh, see these these seniors and uh, they're still going forward with their schoolwork um, a couple of them took a break because they were just finishing up a class and going to the next class when we stopped by um, but our first one is from Bruton High School and Mr. Schaefer, I'll let you take it away from there and All right. do the write-up. Thank you, Jimmy. Uh, the Bruton Senior of the Month for September of 2020 is Hanan Jones. He's at Bruton High School. His principal is Mrs. Arletha Dockery. And Mr. Van Jones is his uncle. Glenda Jones is, is his grandmother. Now, I know Hanan as Jay because Jay was uh, started band and was under my son as his section leader uh, back when he learned. But Bruton High School is proud to honor Jay Jones as our September Senior of the Month. His dedication and love for Bruton High School has earned him this honor. Since the ninth grade, Jay has supported our school by providing technical theater assistance as a member of the sight and sound crew. He also volunteered to create and edit class videos and provide support for numerous student-led mm -hmm. projects. During his 10th grade year, he joined the band program and learned to play the saxophone very quickly. Now that's a big task when you're just starting out in band as a sophomore in high school. 
As a member of the band, Jay quickly found both a family and a passion for music. He served as a section leader and a Suda ambassador and enjoyed giving back to the band and its family by welcoming new members. He is most proud of the impact that he has had to inspire others to learn how to play a new instrument, as well as encouraging others to have pride in their school. Jay has proudly served Rutan High School in several leadership roles as a PALS mentor for two years, sight and sound crew leader, varsity basketball manager, spring sports announcer, pep band director, band president, and woodwind captain. In addition, he has participated in marching band and jazz band. He's interested in attending Hampton University next fall to major in music education. Jay plans to become a director. Congratulations, Jay. Good job. So next we have uh, our next senior of the month is from Grafton High School and Mr. Higginbotham. Yes. Uh, the senior of the month for September 2020 from Grafton High School is Julie Stonier. Uh, parents are Michael and Amanda Stonier. It is with great pleasure that I share with you Grafton Senior of the Month, Julie Stonier. Julie is, the kind, is a kind-spirited student who exhibits great maturity and a positive attitude daily towards her teachers and her peers. She has the leadership qualities that are respected by anyone who encounters her while showing her dedication to her academics and community environment. Focused on being a well-rounded student, Julie challenges her abilities while taking rigorous courses and participating in extracurricular activities. One accomplishment Julie is most proud of is the 2019-2020 yearbook Envision. It was her first year as editor-in-chief in Grafton, and she worked diligently making the yearbook uh, a success with the many challenges Grafton experienced with the electrical fire and then COVID-19. Being editor-in-chief allowed her to experience greater responsibility by focusing many hours a week on the yearbook. However, she's proud of the result, making all the hardships worth it. She has the desire and motivation to succeed in all that she does, and she goes beyond her expectations. Julie has a wonderful personality and shares her concern for others in and out of the building. Her peers recognized her commitment and compassion to serving others and elected her as the class president. She enjoys giving back to the community and participates in various volunteer activities through her membership in school organizations and her own uh, community interest. She's a member of the National Honor Society, Spanish Honor Society, and English Honor Society, where she has learned the importance of serving others, building positive relationships, and hard work. As a member and co-president of the Special Olympics, Julie worked to promote respect and equality for all students and participates and helps plan inclusive activities. She's also a member of the Key Club and the YMCA Leaders Club, where she continues to aid others and fulfill her passion to making the world a better place. Julie also splits her time at the YMCA while working with children and the community. We are so proud and honored to have Julie serve as a role, as a role model to all of our Clippers. Congratulations, Julie. Wonderful. And our next senior of the month is from Tab High School, Mr. Myatt. It's my pleasure to introduce uh, the Tab High Senior of the Month for September. It's uh, Aaliyah McGill. Uh, her parents are um, Alan and Melissa. Again, uh, Ali is a highly accomplished student who has maintained a 4.6 grade point average uh, while completing a very uh, demanding program of studies. In fact, upon graduation, she will have completed 12 advanced placement courses. Despite her heavy academic load, Ali dedicates her free time to pursuing her passion for music. Ali participates in girls ensemble, jazz choir, and the Tri M Music Honor Society. She has had six years of classic voice lessons, three years of guitar lessons, and seven years of piano lessons. Aaliyah represented TAB and won the delegate at uh, District Chorus as a freshman, sophomore, and junior, honors at the National Association of Teachers uh, of Singing Competition, and first and second place, respectively, in the Lions of Virginia Band Competition. She focuses on what she loves and is committed to her personal development and improving. In addition to her commitment to music, Aaliyah has managed to contribute a great deal of personal time and efforts to her school and community in a number of different ways. At TAB, Aaliyah is the founder and president of the French Club, co-president of Student Ambassadors in the Rho Kappa Honor Society, and vice president for Mu Alpha Theta, or the Math Club. She started and facilitated a pen pal program with independent, with, with independent living at the Chesapeake. She has spent time volunteering for Congresswoman Loria's reelection campaign, making calls each week due to her interest in political science and international relations. 
She has um, helped York County residents as a Safety Town Assistant Group Leader, a junior volunteer at the Children's Hospital for King's Daughter, a math tutor, and participated in the York County Youth Commission. Ali is purposeful, self-disciplined, and a person of integrity who lives by her morals and values. Aliyah is reliable and proactive in bettering herself, our school, and the community, and we're extremely fortunate to have Aliyah as a student at TAB, and we, are proud, uh, and we are very proud to present her as a senior of the month. And again, Aliyah, thanks for your inspirational leadership and your exceptional personal example. Thank you, Mr. Mai. That's perfect. So next, we're going to move on to our senior of the month from York High School, Ms. Geralds. Yes, I have the honor of um, congratulating Rose Bourne as the senior of the month uh, for September from York High School. Principal Dr. Shannon Butler and her parents are Susan Reif and Christopher Bourne. York High School is happy to announce Rose Bourne as our September senior of the month. <coughs> Rose is a dedicated member of the French National, National Honor Society, Mu Alpha Theta, Science National Honor Society, National Honor Society, and the Student Council Association. Within the SEA, Rose has served on the Student Advisory Board and as Vice President. She's currently serve, serving as the SEA President. Rose has taken a challenging course load throughout her high school career and has excelled in the International Baccalaureate Program. In May, Rose was the recipient of the AP Scholar with Distinction Award and the West Point Leadership Award. In 2018, Rose placed first at the York County Science and Engineering Fair and at the Tidewater Virginia Science and Engineering Fair in the Earth and Planetary Science Division. Rose is an active member of her community and has spent countless hours performing with the Fife's and Drums of Yorktown and volunteering at the Edge Hill Pool Snack Shack. She's also completed volunteer hours through her church as a head altar server. Rose is a talented athlete and has competed on the Edge Hill Eels community swim team since 2014. She has also competed on the York High School swim team since ninth grade and has earned a varsity letter each year. Rose, we're happy to have you as part of the Falcon family and congratulations on being our senior of the month. Wonderful, thank you. I'd like to give all of our seniors of the month a big round of applause and congratulate them. All right, well, thank you. Uh, so for unfinished business, we have none. Um, presentations, we're gonna start before we move into our uh, public comment, which is right after this, we're gonna do our capital projects report. Dr. Shandle, if you'd share. Yes, thank you, uh, Ms. Richardson. Good evening, board members. This evening, uh, the only capital work uh, that we're gonna report out tonight is being performed at this time uh, is to tie up loose ends at the Grafton Complex after receiving our certificate of occupancy. Also, the work has begun on the FMP, the facilities master plan, as well as the capital improvement plan. And Dr. Carroll, Mr. Bowen will be working, um, obviously, closely with the county as we move forward. That concludes the brief report. Okay, I was going to ask you, is that it? That's it. <laughs> perfect, perfect. All right, we're going to move into our citizen comments and public participation at board meetings. Um, the school board provides public comment period for public to comment on topics germane to the business of the school board. The school board expects each speaker to be courteous, modeling for our students how one can respectfully disagree with others' views. We ask that the speaker address their comments to the entire school board and not to one individual board member, nor the superintendent or staff member or the audience. Speakers will present their comments from the podium, and each speaker may speak up to three minutes. The timer is visible to the speakers from the podium, and speakers should conclude their remarks when the red light comes on. The timer will begin after you state your name and address. So relating to the safety measures, uh, we're practicing social distancing this evening. We have implemented several changes related to our citizen comments. We're providing individual sign-up sheets and pens for each speaker. We're cleaning the podium and area after each speaker, and we ask that you speak loudly as the safety shield muffles uh, the voice uh, there when you're speaking. So we have one speaker for this evening, and that is Blake Simpson, if you'd come forward. And just state your name and address for the record, and then the timer will start. I can take those off up there? Yeah, absolutely, you sure can with the, with the shield there, yes, sir. <laughs> All right, well, thank you very much. I'm Blake Simpson. My address is 2311 Seaford Road. And um, see for Virginia. So, uh, thank you very much uh, for allowing me to speak. Um, so, I was just wanted to tell you what I'm seeing uh, firsthand. I got two boys, uh, one in third and one in fourth. Um, the the school days are, are, in my opinion, pretty short. Um, the amount of time that they actually are getting lessons um, is not exactly what I was expecting. Um, so they go for four days, and then, you know, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, uh, they check in, they get a little bit of assignment that they're supposed to be doing on their own, 
And then, of course, on Thursday and Friday, again, these are short days. Um, so uh, <laughs> what ends up happening, luckily I'm able to work from home, uh, but there's uh, always a lot of hiccups. They're always coming to me for something or another, or when they do come to me, and I tell them, hey, when you're done, you're supposed to come let me know. And they come quite soon. Uh, and then I have to go and look at what they've done or not done. I have to do my investigative work. Uh, so it's, it's not easy uh, with, with being, at, being at home. So I, I'm all for us going back to school. I really want the children to go back. And with that being said, you know, I kind of would think that we're looking towards all the other places that have gone back to school, private schools, colleges. And as far as I know, we really haven't had any major outbreaks. Um, so uh, again, I, 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 I'm lobbying for us to go back just as soon as we can. I understand you guys have a uh, probably a phased approach, uh, but that that's uh, if, I'm sure that there are plenty of other people. They're just not here. Um, the other thing uh, that concerns me now is, is the going back for two days out of the week. Uh, so I spoke with uh, my son's teacher this morning. She had told me what she's going to plan is it's the same lesson all week. So Monday, Tuesday, that group gets that lesson. Thursday, Friday, that group gets that lesson. So in the, for the other three days, these children are supposed to be doing this work about the two days of the lesson on their own and then continuing on with that. Like I said, they're <laughs> very hard to keep on task. They're just little children. Uh, so this idea of cutting the teacher's time in half in which they have to provide a certain amount of lesson is concerning to me. I really would, uh, don't know how they're going to, I'm sorry, go through the, get to the SOLs and actually have a shot of doing well. Um, and um, yeah, I just was hoping maybe we could have the camera in the back and then you know that way they would still be able to sign on and, and see what's going on those other days again I know you guys have your plans um, but that's uh, that's my, my concern thank you very much for your time thank you very much for your comments appreciate you coming out tonight to uh, to speak to us so I'm now going to close our public comment period we have no one else assigned to speak and I'm going to move on to matters by board members, but it's my understanding you're, there's, we're going to speak a little bit on the back to school plan. Is that during your report? We are so we're on the superintendent's report this evening. Dr. Carroll is going to share two items. He's going to share, um, we brought um, special education students back today, so he's going to share a little bit about uh, today. Okay. He's also going to share, he, we had a call this morning with the state superintendent, so he's going to provide the board with a brief update on uh, health metrics. And then Ms. Skinner and Dr. Wrights are going to um, share some information related to the back to school plan as far as um, pre-K, K, and first grade. So they'll Wonderful. share that information on the superintendent's report. Okay, thank you. Yep. So uh, next we're going to have matters by board members. So I'm going to start with Mr. Higginbotham to share remarks. Start with you. So um, believe it or not, we're now three weeks through uh, of, of school. Um, it's been sort of a whirlwind, I think, for the students, for the teachers, for parents, um, certainly. Um, I'm lucky enough to see it from all three sides as a teacher, you know, myself outside of the division, and then I've got two kids, a second grader, fifth grader who attend school here, um, and then, you know, as the parent with them, and then uh, my wife's a teacher as well in York County, and dealing with that, we, we fully understand um, the situation that we're in, and uh, it is it is tough. But I, I want to thank the parents out there for putting in the time to to continue to work with the students, uh, with or with their kids at home, and the teachers that are also putting uh, the additional the additional time in. I mean, teachers, administrators, paraeducators, uh, counselors, and and everyone is just putting in so much additional work than than what typically happens in these these times. And I just want to thank everybody. Uh, for that effort and dedication, uh, knowing that it will be temporary at some point. It just does not feel that way right now because we've sort of been in it. And as we uh, move through it and we navigate it, there, there are hiccups and there are going to be troubles. And we, we work live to, to figure them out and to uh, find the best plan to keep everybody safe and everybody learning. And I just want to thank everybody who's doing that, and, and I truly mean it from the parents. I see it going home after, after I get home, helping my kids with the asynchronous work uh, that's going on and, and reviewing what was submitted through Canvas and everything. And um, 
hopefully things are starting to, to level out now and, and some routines are, are being made. Um, but I'm excited to, uh, to, to see as we move forward in this process the um, kids being able to see people alive and in person and for uh, them to get that excitement and then hopefully bring that home and that might help with, with some of the um, you know, asynchronous work with them being more uh, excited to, to work on that. And you, my, my kids in elementary school, they, they, they find that time they're at home, they see this toy over there that's not normally there when they're doing work and they wanna go to that. So hopefully that'll start to, to rein some of that in. Uh, but I also wanna give a shout out to, to everyone in the staff who is doing all the meal pickups. Um, through this year. Uh, I've had a chance to go by Dare Elementary School and Tab High School and just thank them as they've been passing, passing out some of those meals. It's such a great service we're able to provide to anyone, all, any student in York County uh, who needs that or who, who wants it and might have that food insecurity um, or you know, a kid just might need to run between classes or a session and grab the apple juice or, or something like that. So it's, it's just wonderful to see that continuing. And, and I hope we can continue that for, for a while as, as we continue going. And I do wanna give a shout out to all the schools that were out uh, the week before school started when we had you know, a couple days in that 90 degree heat. They were out there for multiple hours passing things out to you know, seniors at York High School getting, getting their, their stuff. Coventry Elementary had people uh, out giving all the material, well, every elementary school is passing out all those materials and things like that. So, you know, they were out extended hours from, from their normal working time, and I just want to thank them for that, that time and dedication that they were giving. Uh, and then congratulate all the seniors of the month as we got to go back out and see some of them, and they got their yard signs, and we were able to see some people in person just, you know, from a distance. And I was smiling at them, even if you couldn't tell because I had my mask on, but we're proud of you guys, and we look forward to uh, hearing all the amazing things that uh, everyone's doing. So that's all for me today. Thank you, Mr. Higginbotham. Mr. Mai. Oh, sure. Came down to the District 5 at the bottom. Huh? <laughs> we jumped, we jumped well, you know what? As the uh, representative to the um, uh, Career and Technical Education Advisory Committee, I just wanted to uh, commend and uh, congratulate Dr. Shandor and the uh, school division team for being recognized by the State Board of Education for a school division of innovation. And I've got the press release in front of me, so I'm just going to highlight a couple of things. So this was last week, State Board of Education recognized York County School Division, one of only 14 to be designated as a School Division of Innovation. And this is the first time that the State Board has um, designated uh, these, these awards or recognition. And divisions are selected for designing and implementing alternatives to, to, to traditional instructional practices and school structures that improve learning to promote college and career readiness and good citizenship. So uh, we earned the designation. I think, if I'm not mistaken, there are 132 yeah. divisions in the, uh, in the state of Virginia. So um, one of 14. So again, uh, congratulations, Dr. Shandor, and uh, to the CTE team. Uh, hey, just want to highlight a couple of, um, of themes. Uh, Mr. Higginbotham did such a nice job. But um, those things that resonate with me in my interaction with teachers and uh, parents is um, team and teamwork in continuing to work through this and flex as we need to to give our children a safe and um, as best as we can um, a good virtual learning experience. Um, we did have a significant or major milestone today as we welcome back a select group of those students and families with special needs um, to in-person instruction. And we went through the whole life cycle in that. We went through transportation, we went through instruction, we went through meals. And so um, again, that's a huge first step However, I think we all appreciate that it is just a first step. Uh, we have plans and we continue to move to uh, bringing children back to the classroom. But I would uh, say to our families and our community, um, it's gonna remain a challenge and uh, we need to continue to work in a positive way as we have and, um, and, and again, in a, in a team uh, manner uh, and we can uh, continue to uh, push through. And then again, as Mr. Higginbotham said, um, uh, heartfelt thanks to all of our teachers, and staff, our leadership teams at the school level, uh, those um, uh, leaders at the, at the school division um, who, again, uh, these challenges are being worked hour to hour, day to day. And um, again, we've uh, a major milestone today and a, ma and a major uh, first step. So my, uh, my personal and heartfelt thanks. All right, Ms. Geralt. Sure. Um, it's been a wild start for new school board members, and I'm kind of bummed that I skipped that 
training session that was how to be a school board member during the pandemic. I think each of us could have benefited from that training session. Um, and I know that each of us up here, um, our heart is in the right place and we're doing everything we can to not only listen to families but get student feedback, um, ask the right questions um, because we do want what's best for our students and staff and families. Um, I, the past couple of weeks I've spent some time um, going to houses and supervising, not supervising, but just kind of witnessing what kids are going through and I just want to say thank you to the parents and the caregivers who invited me to do that and for the kids for being so candid uh, with their feedback. Um, I do think that the feedback that's being shared is what's making things keep moving forward, adjustments that have been made so far and I think we're going to keep making those adjustments. Um, because we do want what's best for kids. So again, keep sharing that feedback, uh, not only with your school, but uh, with us so we can get it to the appropriate people. And again, reaching out to your school is the best avenue for information. I know a lot of times we're relying on what social media is telling us and the answers people are giving on social media, but that is not always correct. So I do implore you to reach out to your school for information. I think that's the best way. Um, and a lot of the things that we would normally be doing when school started, going to PTA meetings, going to back to school nights and open houses, we haven't gotten to do. And I look forward to when we can get back to doing the things that uh, we want to do as school board members. But I do encourage everybody to still join your PTAs and um, find ways to be active in the school community um, because it does take a village. So I encourage you to do that. All right. Thank you. And Mr. Schaefer. Yes. I'd just like to say that um, the biggest thing that I've seen is a can-do attitude uh, from the students to the teachers to the parents. It's just been unbelievable how, how good it's gone uh, and how many positives that we've had. I mean, we've had some bumps and some hiccups, but by and large, it, uh, everyone has worked together to make it a, a, a very profitable experience for our children. Now. One of the things that has really come into its own is the teamwork of the teachers in the classrooms because each grade, they have team members and they help out each other and they've grown closer and we probably have bonds that have been formed that are a lot tighter at this point in time of the year that normally wouldn't be here until second semester. Um, just to give you an example of, uh, of some of the fun things that have happened. Uh, my wife is a first grade teacher she was there on that 90 degree day of uh, handing out uh, packets to everyone and they were in their masks going up to the cars and all. And then after the first day of school, uh, my wife got a call from one of the parents. She said, I just wanted to let you know that my daughter said, you are the coolest teacher. And my wife goes, why is that? She said, because here it was, it opened, opened a house. She couldn't see your face. You were covered up uh, with a mask. She said, but mom, my teacher has a nose ring. She is too cool. <laughs> couldn't believe it. So if you don't think that your, your kids are really paying attention at school, they are paying attention to every detail when those teachers are teaching. I did get a chance to go uh, visit all four of my schools. I, uh, Vic and I went uh, and I had gotten some uh, big bowls and filled them with candy and got uh, coupons from work, you know, and uh, we went to each school and, and passed them out to all the teachers and staff that were there. Uh, so all the paraeducators, everyone else got coupons for free donuts or coffee or a sandwich and stuff, and then they had candy to eat. Uh, but by and large, it's been a very positive experience, I think, so far. Uh, as I said, there's some some problems, but the biggest lesson I think that everyone has learned is patience, and I think that everyone's trying to work through it and do the best they can. Thank you, Dick. Thank you, Mr. Schaefer, and I'd just like to say that I was able to visit some of the schools on the first day of school uh, with Dr. Shandor. Uh, we visited some of the schools down on the lower end. Um, we were able to go into the classrooms where the teachers had the, the students on the, the virtual classes and, um, and see how they were doing. and. One was just so energetic. She was getting the kids up and having them do some exercise, a little brain break, and um, it, it, it just looked looked promising for what we were. We, we weren't sure what to expect um, with the virtual learning, and we still don't know all the ins and outs of that. I don't think, but um, we're working through it as we have to with with COVID. Um, but I do want to echo Mr. Higginbotham's sentiments and all the other board member sentiments about uh, kudos to all the teachers, bus drivers, paras all those that were out there that day. I hope I didn't miss anybody, but I'm sure I did. Uh, that were out there passing out those devices and getting everything uh, because we were at the last minute. Um, 
because we didn't decide to go virtual until the last minute and vote on that. And uh, we did order um, the computers and that's, that sort of thing uh, with everybody across the country. So we were, we were all trying to get those devices. Um, but I would like to say that, um, you know, we want to continue to move back our kids, just like uh, one of the board members mentioned, but we want to do it safely. Um, and to our parents, um, please be patient with us. We're trying to do the best we can with what we've been dealt. Um, it's, it's been very difficult, not just for our division, for every division across the country. And um, so we're trying to do the right thing. Our school division has always been top notch. It still is top notch. It's one that people move here for our schools. So I think uh, the leadership that's in place here is making the right decisions as well and guiding us and, and giving us um, many good options for us to choose from uh, for our children. But anyway, I'm going to wrap it up with that. But thank you, everyone, for your comments. So we're going to move into financial matters, and I'm going to ask Mr. Schaefer to discuss the financial matters at this time. All right. We have two months worth. Uh, we're going to do September 1st, and then we'll do August. Um, the significant expenditures for August included $157,300, and most of that was for licenses, uh, software license, license renewal with the, with the first month of school. Then we had $1,667,000. That was for IT, and the neatest thing was was one thousand three hundred one million three hundred fifty thousand of that was for the Chromebooks and uh, the con uh, content filtering software that have been uh, sent out to to the whole school division, along with uh, two hundred sixty four thousand eight hundred for devices uh, for the one to one program from Apple. Uh, then we had. Payments for operations totaled $57,200. That was mainly for utilities. Payments for food services totaled $101,100 and was split between uh, Sodexo and Tyson. We had payments related to construction and maintenance projects uh, totaling just above half a million dollars for work at the Grafton Complex, the vestibule at Tab High, and the one at Dare. Um, and for August, uh, we had uh, August revenues. Local revenue for August 2020 is up by more than 150000 from August of 2019. In previous years, summer school tuition was collected at the schools and later transferred to the school board office. This past summer, it was collected at the school board office and revenue was recorded immediately. State revenue for August uh, 2020 is up by more than 700000 from from the previous August. Projected enrollment for state funding is higher in fiscal year 20 than 19. However, actual enrollment for fiscal year 21 is significantly lower than projected. So the expected that estimated uh, state payments will be adjusted downward later in the fall. Sales tax is about 218,000 higher in August than in August uh, 2019. However, it, it's also expected that sales tax revenues will be adjusted downward later in the fall to reflect a decrease in a revised statewide uh, tax projections. For expenditures, expenditures for instruction, transportation, and administration and health have decreased from August 19th as a result of the school closures and a temporary hiring freeze due to the significant decrease in enrollment. And expenditures for IT and operations have increased due to the implementation of the one-to-one -one technology program and an increase in cleaning supplies. Uh, Significant changes relating to the food service budget. The federal revenue for food service is up by more than 146,000 as a result of the USDA's decision to reimburse the school for meals provided throughout the summer. Food service expenditures for August 2020 have increased 109,000 when compared to 2019, again, because we provided meals throughout the summer. Uh, now we have a consideration of uh, approval of resolution 20-38 a resolution authorizing a specific procurement. Resolution 20-38 requires us the, our approval, the board's approval, authorizing procurements of more than $50,000. There's one item on the uh, resolution for uh, Citrix license renewal for $380,000, $12.50. I don't know how they came up with 50 cents. But Mr. Chairman, I now move to approve financial matters as listed. Thank you, Mr. Schaefer. And uh, is there a second to that motion? I'll, I'll second. second. 
Okay. Um, we've had a motion and a second. Before we turn it over to Ms. Ford for the vote, we'll be doing our vote um, by voice. She's had some connectivity issues with uh, board docs, so we'll be doing We're it back that on. way. We're You're back, back on? on. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Good to go. Okay. All right, Ms. Ford, go ahead. Yes, the motion was made by Mr. Schaefer and seconded by Mrs. Geralt to approve financial matters as listed. Board members, you may cast your vote. Okay, and the motion has passed unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. And I just got it back that you had connection, so thank you. Sorry about that. Um, we're going to move on to our consent calendar, and our consent calendar has four th items on it, approval of personnel actions, approval of donations in the amount of $300, and approval of minutes from a regular meeting on August 24th, 2020. Is there a motion to approve the consent calendar as listed? It's just three items. I apologize. I move that we approve the consent calendar as listed. Okay. Is there a second? I'll second. All right. Ms. Ford? Yes, a motion was made by Mrs. Gralts and seconded by Mr. Schaefer to approve the consent calendar as listed. Board members, you may cast your vote. And the um, motion was approved five to zero. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Ms. Ford. Next, we're going to move on to action items, and this is the approval of a proclamation for Bullying Prevention Awareness Month for October 2020. Dr. Shandor, I'll let you share some comments before we take that. Over 20% of the youth in the United States are estimated to be involved in bullying each year, either as a bully or as a victim. It's important for parents, students, teachers, and coaches and school administrators to be aware of bullying and to encourage discussion of the problem as a school community. So let the month of October 2020 be recognized as Bullying Prevention Month with the intention that the issue of bullying and its prevention will be discussed in all York County schools during that time. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shandor. So is there a motion to approve the proclamation for Bullying Prevention Awareness Month for October of 2020? I move to approve. Is there a second? Second. All right, Ms. Ford. Yes, the motion was made by Mr. Higginbotham and seconded by Mr. Myatt to approve the proclamation for Bullying Prevention Month, and you may cast your vote. The motion passed five to zero. Thank you. All right, so next we have our policy discussions, um, our consideration of revisions of policy, and we have numerous ones here. So, Dr. Shandor, I'm just going to turn it all over to you for all of these, uh, as we have one, two, three, four, five, six of them uh, to go over this evening. Thank you, Mr. Richardson. Again, uh, good evening, board members. So this evening, as Mr. Richardson indicated, we have a number of, of policies that we're going to review with you this evening. Um, first, we're going to um, have Dr. Jim Carroll, who is our Chief Operations Officer, review uh, policy EBCB safety drills. Dr. Carroll. All right, thank you, Dr. Shandor, Chairman Richardson, members of the board. As Dr. Shandor said, I've got two policies for you tonight. The first is EBCB. Uh, these changes are driven mostly from changes in state code. First, it proposes language under the fire drill section to reflect direction given by the state. It adds language <coughs> under the lockdown section that prescribes a new schedule for drills where we'll now be doing two drills during the first 20 days uh, that school is in session and then one additional after the first 60 days. Also part of this is um, some efforts to minimize the negative effects of these types of drills. So parents will now be given 24-hour notice of all lockdown drills. Furthermore, pre-kindergarten and kindergarten shall be exempt from mandatory participation in the first 60 days. We also have changes to school bus safety drills. Now, that section specifies that at least one drill will be conducted in the first 30 days of each school semester. We also added the annual earthquake drill uh, that the division's been conducting at least once per school year. And finally, there's a proposed change to, that revises the legal reference. I'm happy to take any questions at this time on EBCB. Okay. All right, hearing none, Dr. Carroll will now move into <coughs> policy JJAC student athlete, um, excuse me, student athlete concussions. Dr. Carroll. Okay, thank you. So just one change here. Uh, staff proposes addition of an item number one in accordance with state code. 
This item outlines uh, that each student athlete and their parents or guardian shall receive from the division <coughs> annual information about concussions that we're going to provide to the parents. And once they receive that information and before engaging in any extracurricular physical activity, uh, the parents will review and sign a statement acknowledging such receipt. Dr. Carroll, is that something, weren't we already doing that? Because my son was in sports uh, a couple years back and I thought we were already doing Yeah, the difference is the timing. We typically would do it after the team was selected. This okay. now will be on the front end of the process before tryouts. Understand. Thank you. Any other questions for Dr. Carroll? All right. Thank you, Dr. Carroll. All right. Next, we're going to bring up Ms. Skinner, and she has uh, four policies. We'll let Dr. Carroll do his cleaning yeah. first. It's my new job. Hopefully, your wife won't see this. <laughs> All right, Ms. Skinner, our Chief Academic Officer, is now going to review four policies. She's going to start with a, a consideration of a revision to policy IAA. Ms. Skinner? Hey, good evening, Chairman Richardson, members of the board. Policy IAA, Notification of Learning Objectives, requires the school division to give yearly notice of learning objectives, SOLs, and diploma options to parents and students. Additionally, it requires that we provide parents with specific information regarding graduation. In July of this year, House Bill 410 was passed, which requires the school divisions to enact policy that provides timely written notice to parents of any student who undergoes literacy and response to intervention screening and any student who does not meet the benchmark of any assessment used to determine at-risk learners. Policy IAA has been amended to include this new requirement. Do you have any questions for me regarding that policy? Any idea what timely means? I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. Timely, what does, is there a, a, it, a time frame? It doesn't um, indicate timely for us. It would, um, we certainly want to make sure parents know about these before their student would take that assessment. Oh, okay. And for some of us, for like our PALS assessment, that's, that's done quickly into the school year. So mm -hmm. we'll need to make sure we provide those um, in time for the parents. Consideration of revision to policy IKFD, Alternative Pathways to Attaining Standard Units of Credit. I'll turn it over to Ms. Skinner. Okay. School Board Policy IKFD allows the board to waive the 140 clock hour requirement and award of standard unit of credit when one of three pathways are pursued by a student and mastery is demonstrated. Policy IKFD was suspended during the April 22nd school board meeting last year. This was due to the school closure that was ordered by Governor Northrum on March 23rd. The main reason for amending this policy is to add a disclaimer about the emergency guidelines for local alternatives to awarding standard units of credit that VDOE, excuse me, VDOE provided during the FY20 school year. These guidelines will need to be included in the policy until all impacted students have graduated. And while reviewing that policy, we identified a few other substantive changes that uh, we felt needed to be made. The first is um, statements providing clarity to the definition of a standard unit of credit and defining the eligibility criteria for a student to seek a standard unit of credit. Those were added. A statement providing clarity regarding equitable access to assessments that have a monetary cost was also added to the policy. And finally, a statement that allows the board flexibility of the 140 clock hour requirement in the event of a significant or extenuating circumstance at the school division or state level was added. Do you have any questions for me regarding that? You said that was until all students impacted? Were yes. So, so, our, so like eighth graders last year who were taking a high school credit? We even have actually a seventh grader last oh, okay. year that was taking high school credit. Okay, yes. So, so we would need to, to there. it'll stay a part of that policy until those students graduate. Okay. Good. All right, we'll move into our third policy under Ms. Skinner. <laughs> so the next one is consideration of revision to policy IKF, standards of learning, test and graduation requirements. Ms. Skinner. So policy IKF provides information on the established educational objectives known as the standard of learning, as well as a program of instruction that is aligned to these assessments. So I'm, I'm gonna repeat what I just said for the last one a little bit, but 
I feel like it's necessary just to make sure that you understand why we're making this change. So policy IKF was suspended during the April 22nd school board meeting last year. This again was due to the school closure that was ordered by our governor on March 23rd. The main reason for amending this policy is to add a disclaimer uh, about the emergency guidelines for locally awarded credits that VDOE provided during that school year. These guidelines will need to be included in the policy until all impacted staff have graduated. And just like before, while we reviewed that policy, we did, we did identify a few other substantive changes that we would like to make. First, in order to the, uh, align to the Virginia School Board Association language, it is recommended that the name of the policy be changed to the Virginia Assessment Program and Graduation Requirements. And secondly, the statement about using an SOL test as a grade has been removed. And then finally, clarifying language stating that students do not have to sit for end of course SOL assessments once they've earned their required number of verified credits has been added. Do you have any questions for me regarding those? Okay. All right, we'll move into our last one. A consideration of revision to policy IKFA, locally awarded verified credits. Ms. Skinner. Thank you. Policy IKFA provides guidance for students who are wishing to earn a verified credit for a course but may not have passed the related SOL assessment. Just like I shared before, policy IKFA was suspended during the April 22nd school board meeting. This was due to the closure by our governor um, on that, at that time. The main reason for amending this policy is to add a disclaimer about the emergency guidelines for locally awarded credits um, and this will be included until all impacted students have graduated. While reviewing this policy, we identified a few substantive changes. First, the statement about the specific number of locally awarded credits that may be earned by students was removed. This is because the number of allowable locally awarded verified credits differs based on the student's graduation year. And then second, a statement indicating that the board may award verified credits as part of credit accommodations towards a standard diploma in science and social studies for students with disabilities was added. This was due to a change in graduation requirements since the last revision to this policy. Do you have any questions for me? All right, that was a lot of information. That's that was a lot. So I do want to uh, thank uh, Ms. Skinner, Dr. Carroll, and uh, Ms. Berry who worked really hard on all these policies. Obviously, there were six presented to you this evening. They'll come back to you next month for first read. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I, I read all that on board docs earlier today, and it was it was a lot. It's quite a bit, <laughs> yes. It was pretty lengthy. Um, all right, so now we're gonna move into policy readings. We have no first readings and no second readings on policy. So I believe we're at the superintendent's report uh, is where we're at. So Dr. Shandor. Thank you, Mr. Richardson. Um, so I just have a few points this evening and then I'm going to turn it over to some staff members to give you uh, some additional information this evening. So I feel like um, we've enjoyed a, a pretty positive beginning to the school year uh, in spite of some of the expected challenges that we all knew that we would be uh, facing. We're, we're so fortunate, so fortunate, excuse me, to have um, just amazing students, staff, teachers, and families to work through this. As many of you uh, mentioned in your remarks, you know, it takes a team to work through this. We know there's going to be continued challenges, and we certainly appreciate uh, hearing from our families uh, when they contact you all. Obviously, you share that information with me, and I'll share that with, um, you know, level directors or uh, different folks in the, the school division to make sure that we have some ongoing communication with them to work through, through their issues and concerns. And I, I can say this as superintendent, it has been challenging. So speaking as a father, this is very difficult. Um, watching my 10th grader, my 7th grader, and my 4th grader navigate this is very difficult. Um, but I also see on the other side of the camera teachers working incredibly hard to, to try to make this work as best we can. So um, I appreciate the, the patience of everyone, the grace, and um, just, just working through it, trying to work through these things. Um, and I think we're really finding out uh, what we're made of as far as a team and, and teachers in a community that we know at it, it, the very core of this is what's best for our kids. We all know that. And um, you know, when, when tough times hit, it's important to come together and try to work through these things together. So I, I certainly appreciate all of the work that everyone has done and everyone's resilience and dedication is certainly appreciated within the school division as far as um, our teachers, principals, assistant principals, but 
you know, those folks, uh, paraeducators, uh, bus drivers who were either driving a bus today or handing out devices um, throughout the last, you know, several weeks, all of our teachers standing out in the heat, handing out equipment, answering phone calls. Uh, we have folks handling issues at night, uh, teachers contacting students at night. You all get the emails as well as I do about that are um, from parents appreciating the dedication and work of our folks. Um, I did want to mention I was able to visit, uh, I believe, all 19 schools uh, thus far. Again, very impressed with the engagement and, and how we're connecting with our families and our kids um, in, in this virtual um, environment that we're in. School board members, many of you joined me for those visits, and, and we were certainly excited uh, to see the creativity with the teachers. Um, I, I know this, and I've said this in many, many meetings with our principals, assistant principals, and executive team. Our teachers did not sign up for this job to sit and look at a screen and work with kids. They worked, uh, you know, they went to school and, and did all of this hard work to actually work with kids, be in the classroom with them, as Mr. Higginbotham knows, as a teacher. Uh, this that special connection, sort of where, where the magic happens, so to speak, to see a spark uh, jump in kids. So um, we're still seeing that in this environment, which, which is extremely exciting. I'm super proud of, of our team. Um, and then also, just, just one more note, Dr. Carroll and I had a, the opportunity to meet with a new Langley Air Force Base military school advisor, uh, Colonel Tim Heritage. Um, that meeting was set up by our uh, Tammy Edwards, who's our military liaison with the county. Um, he assumed that position in, in new to Langley. We had a very productive conversation. We certainly appreciate their ongoing help and, and partnership as we work through this. While we were on the phone, we were still navigating some, I believe, some issues and concerns with connectivity with some of our families in Bethel Manor, so we certainly appreciate their work. So at this time, I'm going to ask Dr. Carroll if he'll please uh, go to the podium. He is going to share some information uh, first about today. As you know, today was the first day that we brought students back into the buildings. So I'll turn it over to Dr. Carroll. Thank you, Dr. Sandor. First, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank everyone involved in our planning for this school year over the summer. As the board has recognized in previous meetings, it's been an arduous task for our staff, and particularly as we put together the preparations for this week and for next. I'd like to recognize Elaine Gould, Candy Skinner, James Lash, Greg Dolak, and their teams, their entire teams, for the work to get us ready to this, to this point. In the past couple of weeks, we've been bringing into the buildings individual students uh, for different required assessments, including English learners, gifted students, and special needs students. Today, we started uh, signups registration for athletic conditioning, so that's gonna be starting soon. Also today, we also brought in students while adhering to the VDH guidelines, select special education students. Those students numbered over 60 and are now attending school two days a week in 10 of our schools. Uh, from the reports that I got today, meals were on schedule, transportation was on schedule, behavior was good. We had a couple of students that had mild concerns about a return to the buildings. Related services was able to push in teachers felt adequately prepared with uh, PPE, parents were excited, and all in all, a good day. This return to school is the first of many steps we hope to take to return to full school. That desired end required design of special bus routes, prepping our schools and buses for extra hand sanitizer dispensers, painting directional arrows on the floor and waxing over them. Moreover, Part of prepping the schools was bringing in Mr. Kevin Pierce from the Peninsula Health District to observe our preparations and to ensure that we were in accordance with their guidelines. So we had a successful day and we look forward to the next step, which Dr. Reitz will be sharing in a few minutes after my second report and after any questions you might have about today. have questions I just want to say congratulations I just yeah, love yeah. positive reports like that so thank you, thank you. Thank you. all right so as you know our COVID experience and the environment is ever-changing my second item is to brief you on new information that we were alerted to last week and briefed on just this morning the Virginia Department of Health unveiled new tools on their website They've been sharing information with us on a limited basis since last July using internal data tools 
and maps that the public can't see. However, they have been working on a public-facing interface, and during that planning, just uh, as of September 15th, the CDC published new guidance surrounding seven data metrics placed in three groupings. These are distinctly different than what VDH shared with us this summer with eight metrics. Uh, only two of those remain, and the other five are a measure of how we are conducting our own mitigation standards. So five of them are completely under our control that are grouped in one group, and then two metrics that we know uh, in the past that are being tracked, uh, positivity rates, test rates, and then also new cases per 100,000 uh, citizens. So uh, the division cited this new guidance was coming and there's gonna be a possible change in how we report out, and we did that last week. We reported that we would be looking at this with our weekly, weekly, weekly health metrics report. That will either start this week or next. Uh, we will be working this week and maybe next to create that uh, on our webpage to reflect this new guidance as we know that there are members of the community that are eager for this information to know the direction of the disease and to have some idea when we may be changing the number of students receiving uh, instruction in our buildings. For those interested, the new interface, it went live at 10.30 this morning and it's located in a section of the VDH website called Pandemic Metrics. In the meantime, I would like to leave you and members of our community a few caveats about this information. Uh, number one, uh, VDH reinforces that this data serves as guidance, not uh, a dictate to us or from the state on how to proceed. All decisions are local and we are to make those in conjunction with the local health district. Secondly, uh, we have different timelines. The VDH and CDC data points use differing reporting dates. Uh, VDH tends to use more seven day averages which give you more of a re real time picture of what's happening with the disease, while the CDC uses more 14-day averages, which give you the kind of uh, smooths out the trend line so it's not as volatile and might be better uh, used for policy decisions. So they can yield different uh, pictures of the community trans transmission, but they're also both valid. While one can bring up the York County data alone on the VDH website, the division gets an average look at the peninsula as a whole that will not be visible on the VDH site because they don't recognize that as a, a, a group of demarcation. We define that because those are the divisions that are participating in the New Horizons program. So that has interest for us. So we work with the local health department for them to give us an adjusted uh, average of those six divisions. So that won't be readily available on uh, the VDH site. And finally, uh, VDH is gonna be looking at this data for uh, the next two weeks or so, testing the CDC new uh, metrics and thresholds to see how it uh, works with them. So they reserve the right after two weeks to make some changes uh, to their website. So uh, that's all I've got tonight and, and open to any questions you might have. I just have one quick question. So the health metrics that we're looking at putting out there for our citizens, we're putting that as a link for them to go to or will it actually be on our site? We may, uh, we haven't had those discussions okay. yet, but we may do that. However, we'll continue with what we're doing, but we may alter how it looks on our website. For those that just wanna go to one place, see the picture, mm -hmm. where are we at right now, that will be available. But for those who want to do a little more digging, a little more investigative work, or who just love those kind of metrics, uh, then we'll probably put that link there. For, but and they can go straight to the VDH. And, and I did uh, say one more question, but just a clarifying thing. Um, this is all ever-changing. We, we continue to get new information, it seems like, weekly almost, or every, every, every day at times. Yes. Um, so I just wanted to reiterate that is still the case. Absolutely. Okay, thank you. And we envision those... VDH is going to spend two weeks looking or drilling down on the metrics, and then they're going to have to adjust their modeling, perhaps, too, inside that window. Okay. All right. They, they may change or they may uh, keep the okay. same. And we'll keep the same in the near term until we learn more from them. Okay. Thank you. Again, just a, a clarifying thing. Um, 
we get a lot of emails, people comparing us to other divisions and what they're doing. And I know that you have said this many, many times, but just to reiterate, we're going by what Peninsula Health District is telling us. We're right. using them as our, our go-to, and that's why sometimes we might be doing something different than another community Well, would for be the doing. health metrics, I mean, there's a lot of reasons why you would make a different decision. First of all, what are they basing their decisions on for health metrics? And they, uh, you, know, you may have a different interpretation from a different, uh, different body. Uh, secondly, you have to remember your operational uh, metrics, uh, your integrity. Can you deliver what you want to deliver for students and parents? Also, you have to remember that every community is different. And so while we ha may have more students that want to return to the building, you may have another community that does not. And then how does that work with your operational integrity? So every context is different. And so we have to remember that and try to match that and deliver what we can. Uh, from what I've seen, we, we just need to be flexible to be able to adjust to anything that happens, pretty much. Pretty much. And, just anything. and, and yeah. that can change every week or every two weeks. Uh, right. Uh, but I think we've done a pretty good job at, at uh, deciding what we're going to do uh, when we have the best information. And on the whole, our, our, our metrics have been trending the right way. However, they could reverse. And so we're going to have to stay flexible in, the, in either direction. So... I, there's been so much talk about which metrics we're looking at, and then you know it's changed at the local level and then at the statewide level. Has there has there ever been any idea that I mean I'm a teacher I like rubrics so has there ever been any idea of creating something or having something passed down to us of if you reach this you know X percentage then you then you could you should consider remote or hybrid leveled or you know all steam ahead or something like that? Well, it has been there all the time in the interim guidance from the VDH that we talked to you about on July 23rd. Uh, with certain uh, transmission levels, then you would consider certain phase guidance from the state. And so when we made our uh, recommendation in July, we were in substantial, as was the whole eastern region, and therefore we uh, that said that f phase one, which was go go remote was the primary uh, recommendation at the time, and you could consider phase two. And so that's why we made the recommendation that we did. You will see with the new CDC matrix, they do tie those numbers under each, under each heading, they do tie the percentages there, and so you can see that. The problem is there are some differences between the CDC and the VDH, and where previously there were four categories which were no, low, moderate, and substantial. CDC now has a five-point uh, difference, which is kind of like a Likert scale. It's a, a lowest, low, moderate, high, and highest. And they have come up with a, uh, a crosswalk for that. Uh, and so we'll continue. So that will be posted, and that's what we're working on: is how do we how do we post that, and how do we get that all together into one place so that we can bring better understanding for our parents that are interested in, in watching those, interacting those metrics. And um, I know, I think we said at the last meeting, there is someone at the Peninsula Health District that parents can reach out to if they have more specific questions about the individual metrics. Right, I don't have that uh, number on, on hand, but they can just look up the Peninsula Health District and call their main, okay. uh, the main uh, line. Excuse me, Dr. Carroll, or they can contact the school board office. We'll have that, there's an email that uh, parents, interested parents, can send to. Um, so we, we can share that information in that fashion for those who are interested. But I think we're heading into a direction where uh, you know, people can, can see that more for themselves. When they had the first, when we first talked about the interim guidance and they had this algorithm of eight different, <laughs> different measures and they were the only ones that could see that, I think that has contributed to an air of not understanding or feeling there's a lack of transparency but uh, they weren't the only ones feeling that way. Uh, we were not getting that story, just a designation of where you're at and looking at the peninsula at a couple of data points. And now we've settled in on two data points uh, that I think anybody can look up for, for York County. So this is gonna give them uh, some more transparency. Uh, but just remember that we're also looking at the larger peninsula because half of our employees live in that, in that area. So that's important for us also because those staff members would be commuting into our district for work. 
just to add one more comment, uh, Dr. Carroll and I also invited Kevin Pierce, who presented at, at one of the board meetings that we had, I believe, in the summer. It, I think it was the July 23rd meeting. Mm -hmm. um, we invited Mr. Pierce to come visit us at, a, at a, one of our elementary schools, just so he can see an example of the mitigation strategies that we put in place. We had Mr. Dolak there, um, Ms. Hutchinson, our health coordinator. So you know, he came there. He um, observed, gave us some, some feedback, and quite honestly, some kudos for, for a lot of the work that we were able to, to do as we're, you know, as we were bringing in students today, you know, more importantly, not more importantly, but as we're opening up 10 elementary schools next week, we, get, we wanted to show him a good model of what does a classroom look like, what do the hallways look like, what are some other mitigations, what are the protocols that you have in place. So um, we certainly leaned on our, on our partners to to provide us some help and support and guidance in that area. We'll also be sending out videos, I believe, this week at some point, um, showing what those mitigation strategies are as far as mask wearing, uh, how, how to walk in the hallway, yellow arrows in the hallway, um, desks. We had, some, we, had some, we had a wonderful little um, student who demonstrated proper hand washing and those types <laughs> of things as well. Right, just to help and remind uh, students mm -hmm. and parents. Mm -hmm. And the information flow is going to shift in the other direction. Generally, it's been community level, division level, but as we introduce uh, students back into school, particularly on a more regular basis, the information is now going to begin to flow from the schools and the leadership teams up to the division. Um, so that's that's another challenge. It's a challenge for the uh, for the school teams and how we manage that data and that information piece. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. That's that's the perfect segue to to close. Any other additional questions for Dr. Carroll? Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to ask Ms. Skinner um, if she'll come to the podium, and I know Mr. Rice, you'll be you'll be close by. Let Dr. Carol clean first. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Ms. Skinner has has a brief presentation this evening. She's going to review our um, some information related to bringing our youngest uh, learners back. Ms. Skinner. Thank you. Good evening, Chairman Richardson, members of the board. Dr. Shandor, um, I want to echo Dr. Shandor's comments earlier, just recognizing our teachers, our paraeducators, who have done tremendous and incredible work um, well before the school year started, but just to learn a new teaching platform, a new learning management system, uh, tons of new software programs, to spend the time building relationships with our students like they have done. Um, and then to provide high quality instruction that they are doing right now. I just think that their work is incredible and I wanted to just publicly thank them for that work for sure. Um, so this evening I am excited to be here to discuss the return to school plan for our youngest learners, which is our preschool through grade one students. They'll be returning as we shared earlier on October 5th. And tonight, I'll give you a brief overview of that hybrid, the hybrid schedule that they will be following. And then I'm going to ask Dr. David Wrights, our Director of Elementary Instruction, to share some additional information with us. So let me see if I can pull this up. I apologize. Here we go. Okay. So last week, uh, families received information about the preschool, kindergarten, and grade one hybrid schedules. The schedule does show a slight change from where when we released that um, plan in July as part of our return to school plan. Um, and I'll share a little bit more about that plan with you in just a minute. But it does, however, still continue to keep our students in two cohort groups, and they are aligned by last name. We also, um, I also want to share that and I think it was mentioned earlier by uh, Dr. Carroll, we are continuously reviewing and um, reevaluating our plan to make sure that we are making the best decisions. Um, as we learn a little bit more, we get a little bit better, and we're trying to listen to our teachers, to our parents, and we're using that information to make informed decisions. I do appreciate our community's patience and support as we, as we make these decisions and move through um, our next steps. I'm going to begin by sharing a little bit about our preschool hybrid schedule. These are our youngest learners, and in a traditional school year, these students attend school for a half day. Um, they typically, during the year, their enrollment grows, and so we um, actually have to end up making adjustments through the school year for these students. Just like kindergarten and grade one, our preschool classes will follow a hybrid schedule, and they will be in cohort groups. Uh, because their schedules are unique, 
and they vary by class and by the program. Our preschool teachers have been reaching out to their families today to go over their schedule with those families. So I don't have an actual preschool schedule to share up here with you because it varies a little bit uh, based on the program. Next, I'll share a little bit about our kindergarten and our grade one schedules. As you might recall, this is the elementary hybrid schedule that we presented in July. Cohort one was attending school in person on Monday and Thursday and participating in remote learning on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Friday. Cohort two attended school in person on Tuesday and Friday and participated in remote learning on Monday, Wednesday, and Thursday. With our change, we have shifted the schedule for students to be in buildings on back-to-back -back days rather than alternating days throughout the week. As I shared uh, Friday, as we shared with families on Friday, cohort one will be primarily our students with last names A through K, and they will attend school face-to-face -face on Mondays and Tuesdays. They will have asynchronous instruction on the other days. Cohort two includes students with last names L through Z. Those students will attend school face-to-face -face on Thursday and Friday, and they will have asynchronous instruction on the other days. We uh, do promise to do our best to try to help support our families in keeping those families whose students, whose children may have different last names together um, in cohort groups. When our secondary school students return to buildings in the hybrid model, they will also follow a back-to-back -back schedule in alphabetical cohorts. As you might recall, we proposed having our cohorts attend school face-to-face -face, um, instruction on Mondays and Thursdays and Tuesdays and Fridays, similar to what our elementary schedule was. The primary difference um, is that the students, they will continue to do an A-B schedule that they're currently following when they transition to the hybrid schedule. On this slide, you'll see that A days are marked in green and B days are marked in blue. Wednesday is both green and blue because those students work asynchronously on their work for both A and B classes on that day. Students in cohort one will attend school face-to-face -face on Monday and Tuesday, and students in cohort two will attend school face-to-face -face on Thursday and Friday. We will share more about our secondary schedules as we get closer to that, that group returning to hybrid instruction. So what I'd like to do now is I'm gonna ask Dr. Wrights to come up, and he's gonna share some additional information regarding our um, hybrid schedules, and then I'll come back up for any questions you might have. Good evening. As the return to school group was reviewing our plans in preparation for bringing our youngest learners back into schools, I pulled together a group of parents, teachers, and administrators to conduct a decision analysis using the Trago Ed tools we often reference. And we're looking at what is the best schedule to follow for our pre-K, K, and first grade populations. So as you can see from this slide, the three criteria that we took into consideration was maximizing health and safety mitigation, increasing our learning opportunities, and supporting our family schedules. This evening, I'm going to share some of the considerations and benefits of this schedule change. As you can see from this hybrid model consideration slide, the first three bullets are things that we are currently doing within our schedule that we plan on continuing to do. One is utilizing Wednesdays to provide targeted interventions, provide opportunities for paraeducator support during asynchronous instruction, and support teacher planning. The next three bullets are things that we're going to put into place that are going to support those three criteria that we talked about with that Trego Ed decision analysis. That is, allowing more time between the cohort if an exposure does occur, support student retention of instructional content through consecutive days, attendance days, and provide consistency for families to secure childcare for three days in a row rather than the staggered schedule. On the day students are learning independently at home, they will continue to have daily interactions with their teachers at the beginning of each day during their morning meetings. 
In turn, we're excited the following benefits will also help our students and families. So the first benefit is increasing our face-to-face -face student interactions. And what we mean by that is it supports our parent concerns that students need to be in the classroom socializing with other students and also supporting our social emotional learning of our kids. And so this opportunity of these interactions will give our parents and our students that opportunity to be able to have those face-to-face -face interactions with each other. The next is increasing face-to-face -face school support services. What we mean by that is we're going to be able to have our school counselors available for face-to-face -face meetings with our students. We will have paras to be able to work with our students, and our reading specialists will be able to work one-on-one face-to-face with our students during those days. And then the next is reducing our screen time. What we mean by this is students will have time, less time on their devices due to the two days they are face-to-face with their teachers and their peers. However, students may bring in their devices during those face-to-face -face instruction days, but primarily, primarily the focus will be the intense instruction of utilizing small groups and one-to-one -one intervention. Earlier this evening, you heard Mr. Simpson talk during the parent community open session about what does asynchronous instruction look like. And so that's what I'm gonna to talk to you about. Um, so if you're sitting there thinking, what on those days where the students are not face-to-face, -face, what does it look like? So let's look at these few bullets on this slide. Resource classes will be given to our students during those days of asynchronous learning. We will still continue to have daily class meetings, which students will log on each day during their morning meetings to meet their social emotional learning and also to take attendance. Independent practice to support in-person instruction. This is extremely important when we're talking about extending the face-to-face -face instruction. What our students are learning during that face-to-face -face time will be extended during those asynchronous times with the lessons that they are provided. Also, those lessons will be developmentally appropriate, and we will also give them opportunities where they're on and off their computers. Some may need some adult support, but our goal is to minimize family technology intervention and promote student independency. Next is instructional support and extension. What that means is we are planning on still continuing to provide small group lessons with teacher or para support, Students may have the opportunity at times throughout their day to join asynchronous lessons while their teacher is face-to-face -face with the students in the classroom. We will continue to have intervention support, extension activities, along with our gifted learners having those gifted lessons. And then we have the flexibility of family schedules with some activities that may require to happen um, during a certain time, like a small group lesson or morning meeting, some of the asynchronous instruction will be flexible in time, which many families may find extremely helpful. It's our intention to have constant communication with all stakeholders as we move through this process in order to provide the best optimal le learning experiences for our students and for our families. And we look forward to welcoming our students into our classrooms next week. And now we will have the opportunity to uh, take any questions. Who's going Go first? Ahead. <laughs> they all point to me. <laughs> I can start, but I'll let you start. No, go ahead. That's fine. <clears throat> no, go ahead. Um, so when we're t we're talking about what asynchronous looks like, I think that's a big concern of families. I know that's one of the things that we're getting a lot of emails about. Um, what does asynchronous look like for our kids? Will they still be face to face? And when you're talking about having you know, the teacher do uh, small group lessons and parents do, doing small group lessons, and I know that you've looked at the staff and we've got people in place to do that. Um, but my concern is the amount of time it's gonna take for our teachers to kind of split those groups. Um, are, I'm just worried about the stress level. So cohort one and cohort, cohort two will be separate, but those kids will have different um, due dates. So how will that look for their families on Canvas? Well, how will we separate that? Have given us some information. So, I'm sorry. 
Um, our teachers have provided us with some information about um, how to how they'd like to see the campus page changed a little bit. I was just meeting with some of my staff today. They're working through some of those ideas to help support our teachers. You know, when we when we change into a new model, there's a lot of new things we have mm -hmm. to learn. So it's going to be really important for us. To, to have our ear to those classrooms, visiting those schools, listening to the teachers, and trying every which way we can to support them, because that what they're doing is nothing short of incredible. We know that. And so um, we, what I can say to you is we're going to do as much as we can to reduce that stress level for them. And a lot of that is listening, trying to help get their feedback, and then being ready to pivot and change as needed. When it comes to the asynchronous instruction, yes, they will have two different groups. And as uh, Dr. Wright shared earlier, um, making sure that um, when they are with those students, they are with those students. That's really important right. to us. That's important to our students as well and our families. And so trying all that we can to make sure that we're supporting them with asynchronous instruction. And Dr. Wright has been working with the principals. I think he meets with them pretty much daily mm -hmm. at this point in time to talk through how they're going to do that and how they can support and use all of the other teachers and paraeducator resources to support them. I don't know if that answered your question or that gave you um, a better okay. feeling about it, but we are working through those things. No, I just know I'm, I'm apprehensive as a school board member, so I can't imagine what a teacher is feeling knowing that these babies that they love so much and they want to connect with are coming back, but they're like, oh, but I know another half of these babies that I want to uh, make mm -hmm. sure I'm connected with too. And my second question was curriculum pacing. Like when you've got them split into two groups, um, is there going to be, I guess, more instruction in those two days or not packing it in because I don't want to use that that word but are we how are we going to pace that to make sure that we're still getting where we need to, to get because I, I have to say SOLs I mean you have to say those words but mm -hmm. just as far as pacing well we certainly one of the the benefits of a small class is right. really to, that allows you to very to, to personalize instruction to those students and so I wouldn't say the word you know like <laughs> cram and that's not what we want okay. to do to our students we want to provide very rich small group instruction and that's what most of elementary instruction really is especially at the younger grades a lot of what they do is through small group instruction it's very targeted to their level and they pace where that student is and so you can you know that when they are with those teachers they're going to be very personalized and how they're they're working with those students and they're, they're going to be doing a lot of informal assessments We've done a lot on the back end, our curriculum specialists have, to support our teachers in learning how to use informal assessments. Some of the things that we've purchased for our teachers, like IXL and a couple of the other programs, will allow teachers to do that a little bit easier than maybe they could have done before. And those informal assessments allow us to move and to really personalize where those students are. Um, so, you know, I think some of those, but the, the pacing piece, our curriculum coordinators have done quite a bit on the back end in Mastery Connect to help with curriculum pacing. And so they've met with the teachers, they've showed them how to work through that curriculum pacing, and then we're gonna be monitoring that. It's gonna be really important for us to continue to monitor that pacing. Okay. Sorry, I didn't know if you had anything else you wanted to say. But. No, I just wanted to add also too, is the curriculum pacing that Ms. Skinner's speaking of, we're also going to really monitor all the time and keep the finger on the pulse of what's happening with our assessments. Are our students doing well with the assessments? Do we need to pivot, and, like Ms. Skinner said, and look at pacing and adjust? But also, too, we're thinking of, we have two different types of elementary schools going on right now. We have our face-to-face, -face, which is coming with our hybrid, but we also have our virtual academy students, which we are constantly monitoring also, which are continuing to stay for the first semester. So we are constantly watching what's happening with that pacing, with that curriculum, um, as we're moving forward. Right. Some of the other emails that we're getting are families who are not ready to come back, but they did choose flexible framework. How are you guys going to handle that? So currently right now we have a protocol in place where our parents can reach out to the school, particular school principal, and talk to the principal about the possibility of a switch. And then um, there's a protocol that the principal will walk the parent through to see if that is the best decision that they want to make for not only their child, but for their family. I know the response that we've been giving families is we're not going to make anybody do something they're not comfortable doing. Mm -hmm. um, so I do appreciate the flexibility in that. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a question or two about like the asynchronous learning. I think um, every child is different. So what one student is able to complete in a short period of time will take another student a much different amount of time. And I, I guess the idea that some parents are looking at three days in a row 
of the asynchronous work, whether it being Wednesday through Friday or Monday to Wednesday, looks pretty daunting uh, to them. So what kind of um, resources are we going to be able to have the teachers provide to those students during that time that, that they might need to reach out or, or to request a little bit extra help or work or maybe even just some flexibility with due dates and deadlines. And that goes from elementary to high school level, really. Um, and I think the asynchronous is the hardest thing, like figuring out the amount of work that's appropriate and due to no fault of the teachers, but figuring out this assignment is not working the best way it might need to be. So um, I think your question is really about how are we going to um, make sure that that asynchronous instruction is really uh, tailored to our students because of the three day. Yeah. Um, and remember our original plan was that we were Monday, Thursday, mm -hmm. Tuesday, Friday. And so one of the things that our teachers had shared with us is they really want the opportunity to teach concepts to students but make sure they truly understand it, having those two days of providing rich instruction before allowing them to move into asynchronous instruction. And so I think that this does provide that opportunity for our students. Um, but it will be very important that our teachers are monitoring that asynchronous work. Some of the software that we've purchased and some of the, the products that we have to support our teachers will allow for some of that um, very appropriate, age appropriate, asynchronous work. Um, our students will be still checking in daily through class meetings, and our teachers will still be checking in with families to see, is, are, are, we, are things going okay? Um, there'll be times, you know, some of our teachers have already talked about bringing our students that are in asynchronous instruction into small groups with paraeducators or themselves. Um, and I think as our teachers get a little bit more comfortable, they may feel more comfortable doing that. You know, right now, we really want them to just to launch and feel really good about you know, those, those students being in front of them. But I can tell you, I've watched teachers who, who knew nothing about Canvas have these wonderful Canvas pages and they are just, you know, giving it all that they can. And so I feel confident that our teachers are gonna be able to do this, but we have to make sure that we're supporting them in that process. So my answer, uh, Mr. Hayball, would be um, a simple answer, but it would be that there's a few things that are, that are important. Number one, we gotta continue to remain flexible, right? So as we make these changes, as we sort of, to steal Mr. Myatt's words from, from a few meetings back, um, crawl, walk, run, as, as we phase in our approach to bring kids back, there's going to be change each time we do it. So we're going to have to be flexible and patient with that as we move forward. So that's the first thing. The second thing is the communication is incredibly important. So if parents have concerns related to those asynchronous days, what are some additional resources? reach out to the teacher first, start there, um, have that communication about what resources, what are some additional resources I can get, or what are some strategies that can help me. Um, it is very difficult. I've got some neighbors that have four elementary kids in their house, and, and I talk to them, and, and, and they just say, you know, it is a challenge. And um, when, when we mentioned bringing two students back, a few of them said, you know, th those two days are fantastic. Um, to know that my child will have two days in a row with a teacher Hopefully, we'll make those asynchronous days a little bit a little bit easier because the the kids can hopefully be a little bit more independent and confident in some of the work. It's very stressful to watch a five year old, or in my case, a nine or ten year old, struggle with what that assignment is just on this device, right? So, having that communication with the teacher, having your students um, self advocate and, and be able to ask for help as well, I think is incredibly important. So again, flexibility and communication, I think, will be the key regardless of the transition, whether it's pre-K-2 or hopefully soon, um, you know, third and fourth grade and, 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 and moving, or, I'm sorry, second and third grade, uh, and then fourth and fifth grade and so forth. But again, these conditions may change given whatever the circumstances are related to the metrics and to our operational integrity. So again, I think as long as we're flexible in our approach and we keep communicating with each other, um, that will help our families. Thank you. I have another question. I'm sorry. Oh, go ahead. Just, so about some um, resources or special uh, resources for people who might need accommodations, whether it's special ed or gifted services and, and things like that. As people return to the building, are we going to utilize those asynchronous days for that so we're not pulling them out of the face-to-face -face instruction? And, yes, and with absolutely. Their... Our, our level one students who are English learners, sorry, 
Um, our English learners, level one, will be coming in on Wednesdays to provide some of that support. So we're trying to capitalize on asynchronous instructional days to provide that enrichment, to provide additional support and scaffolding to our students. We really don't want them as much as possible to miss that time with their teachers. We've also done that with related services. So when you think from a special education perspective, if a child has speech, you know, pull out speech or OT or PT, we certainly don't, we're working on those schedules now. Um, so we, we certainly don't want to bring students back on a Monday and Tuesday, but pull them out of instruction. So we're trying to work through those, um, those plans now. And then, is there any opportunity for students that are not in the age group that are returning to the school to possibly get those um, accommodations and, and those, <coughs> those uh, needs met who might be in the older grades right now during some of those asynchronous days? So, um, yes, yes, currently we are doing some of those things okay. now for our older students, um, and we're going to continue to do those. As we are giving more of like our PALS assessments and our, um, our running records assessments, we're identifying which students need that intervention, and those intervention groups will be happening. Um, we really wanted to spend this first little bit of time with our students, really just building relationships, getting them comfortable. You know, they've, some of them have never even met their teacher, so being online the first time, they want to get to know them, and then those assessments will help guide where we do those interventions and the supports we give. Sorry for filibustering all this. And all, <laughs> also, too, utilizing Wednesdays, which is our, our day that we're going to bring our um, at-risk students or any students that might need some additional help, or um, even on the opposite end that we may be able to enrich and move a little bit further along too. So those are the day, that's the day of the week we really want to emphasize bringing in those students on a more individualized basis. Okay. Thank you. Yes. My, uh, I just want to clarify. You know, first, I think that going back two days back to back is the way to go. The kids will retain it better. They will get more instruction. I mean, it's just a good all around thing for them. Uh, and then on the asynchronous days, say that my child is on grade level, reading, for example, first grade. He's on grade level, he's going through and uh, starting to have a few hiccups. There is gonna be a safety net of small group instruction on those other asynchronous days or just on Wednesday? So those Wednesdays, we're definitely going to utilize that. But if the parent reaches out to the teacher during their office hours and talks about maybe some of the struggles they're having at home, that's an opportunity that we might be able to pull in a para, maybe a resource teacher, another staff member, to be able to provide that support for the student on that asynchronous day beyond the Wednesday. Okay, that's good. Thank you. Well, being last uh, has its advantages because most of you answer my, asked my questions already. <laughs> Ms. Geralt, uh, you asked one about uh, what if a, a parent wants to switch because they made this decision way back and we're moving a little faster than they deem uh, they're ready for, uh, that they can contact the school and we can do what we can, if we can, uh, to work things out so they can continue virtual. Um, the other question that I had was uh, answered, asked by Mr. Higginbotham about uh, days of support that you'll pull the child out for support days on asynchronous days. So that was another question I had. Um, I just want to also mention the back-to-back -back schedule is also uh, good for the parents and the families for, for scheduling purposes as well on top of that. This is very complicated. Uh, there's lots of pieces to the puzzle. I've said this numerous, numerous times. But what hasn't been uh, mentioned is um, staffing that we also not only have to do everything we've already talked about, but we have to make sure we have the staffing that can come back to the school, that they don't have complications, uh, medical reasons that they can't come back and do face-to-face. -face. So uh, we also have that hurdle to overcome as well. Uh, so again, another reason why this is very complicated. Um, so I just wanted to reiterate that. But thank you, thank you, thank you for everything you've been doing. Um, I'd have done pulled my hair out if I was in your job, I know, <laughs> with everything you had to try to consider. And I know we want to get the kids back in school. Um, we want to do that, but we want to do it when it's safe for them to return as well. Uh, but we have both sides that, that you know want two different things, and hopefully we can accommodate as much as we can. Uh, but we want to make a smooth transition and make it safe. But thank you so much for that presentation. Was there any, any other questions anyone had? I, I just thought of one. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> um, 
you had mentioned a second ago these kids haven't met their teacher. We always do open house back to school nights. Right. Is there a plan in place to do something so that when they get there, they know where they're going? Um, so the principals are working through. Okay. Do you want to talk about the communication that you've been having with them? Sure. So I meet with the elementary principals daily just to talk about some of the things that we um, just haven't encountered before. And so we're talking through it together because if um, the principal of Mount Vernon has a way that she has accomplished something, then we share it with the other nine and we're able to learn from it. So as far as students coming back, because they are youngest learners, these are our five-year-olds that have not even been in a building before. And so um, following our social distancing guidelines, we are going to have, uh, I said today, an army of staff outside to be able to greet the parents, the students, to be able to get them to their classrooms where they need. Um, so also too, we're talking half. So it's about roughly around 60 kids that will be coming on Monday per building. Um, give or take, depending on their population. So we do have plans in place to make sure that the students are welcome, that the families feel comfortable when they're dropping their students off, and have that communication with the families, possibly throughout the day, that their kids are okay. Um, so it is going to be tough for a parent to be able to, you know, drop their five-year-old off and then they walk through the building. Um, so we want to be able to have that support. We've also asked our executive leadership team to make sure that we are present on Monday and Thursday of next week being the first day for both cohorts, um, each one of the buildings, just making sure that if questions do come up that we're there to be able to support the school too. Um, so we do have some things in place for that piece, but it is tough with the guidelines that we currently have in place to allow parents into the building to walk to those classrooms. Um, but I do know that coming up, we are going to be doing some virtual open houses um, for the community. And um, Ms. Parr, in operation, she's putting those things together to provide those opportunities for families to have the virtual open house. Great. Thank you Excellent. very much. Final comment. Uh -oh. If I might. Uh -oh. I beat this drum. I'm just going to beat it again. Um, there's a great deal of energy to include the um, uh, additional stakeholders involved in the decision um, analysis and the planning. And I would just offer that we devote the same level of energy to the monitoring, but more importantly, to the measuring um, so we can share those observations and lessons and best practices and make sure that we facilitate that. I know the teachers are doing just that on a daily basis, but that we facilitate that. So thank you, particularly on the asynchronous part. Absolutely. Because that's, that, that, again, is of, of, uh, of most concern. So thank you. This concludes the superintendent. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Shandor. Appreciate that. So our next work session will be held Monday, October 12th, and the specifics relating to the time and location will be shared prior to the meeting. Uh, we're still working out the logistics on that. I'm in discussion with staff on the best uh, location to have that, whether it would be here where we normally have it at your call or an A, B conference room at, at the school board office, which may be a larger setting to, uh, to social distance. Uh, so that's some of the things we're discussing and, and concern, uh, considering right now. We're in need of a closed session. So if there's a motion and a second to take us into the closed session relating to a personnel matter. Sure. I move that the York County School Board convene in closed session pursuant to Virginia Code of Section 2.23711A1 of the Virginia Freedom of Information Act to discuss and consider personnel matters relating to the performance, disciplining, or resignation of a specific employee. Is there a second? Second. Ms. Ford? Yes, the motion was made by Mrs. Gross and seconded by Mr. Schaefer for the school board to meet in closed session. You may cast your votes. I'm sorry, I had to exit it out. Okay, so <laughs> I will mark you out. My vote is yes. Thank you, and it passed five to zero, so you're now in closed session. Thank you. All right, well, everyone have a great week. We're now in closed session, so this meeting's adjourned. Thank you.